Dr. Constantine Dinos Politis um, has been digging in the uh, Levant for a long time. Maybe not as long as the PEF, but uh, getting there anyway. And he's very well known to a lot of us um, from his work, particularly at the site of Zawara, which is where we're going today, at the southern end of the Dead Sea in Jordan. Um, and uh, so this is a site which um, has a, an occupation history going back thousands of years, right the way back to the early Bronze Age um, and right the way through to the Islamic era. So it's a really fascinating um, site that records human history in the region throughout the whole period uh, of, of, of um, uh, settled history. Um, the PEF has been very happy to publish the results of those excavations and surveys in two volumes, Zawara 1 and Zawara 2, and we'll talk a little bit about those at the end of the lecture. But without any further ado, I'd like to pass over to uh, Dino. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, let me just go to the first slide. Okay. <clears throat> first of all, it's a... This is a, a bit of an impromptu talk. It wasn't planned, but I'm very happy to see uh, a nice group of friends and old friends here and supporters. Um, and I have to say from the outset that the Palestine Exploration Fund was really um, the first institution to support this particular project of, that I worked on. And I should also add that they were also uh, supported me on my little previous researches, such as the mud brick adobe research, this is moving by itself, um, that I did um, even, even earlier than this site, and uh, other uh, little projects. But the support that the Past Exploration Fund gave to, to, um, to the Laura Safi uh, project from the outset was very important because it uh, it was a site that was not very well known, and in fact, some of the uh, specific sites that we'll be showing you today were not known at all. And it continued to support uh, 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 projects within this project, such as pottery study, animal bone studies, um, and most lately, um, uh, the part of the Roman Nabataean fortress of Um Tawabin. Uh, and carbon-14 dating uh, uh, um, uh, analysis. So right through the 20 years plus of, of this project, the Palestine Exploration Fund has been, um, has been a uh, steady uh, and consequently major supporter of this project, which is now, as Victor said, published in two volumes, and the third one coming. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to be here and presenting this today. Um, the other thing I absolutely need to say, this is the photograph on the cover of volume one, and I'm very happy and honored that the photographer of this photograph is here today with us. Um, it's a fantastic photograph because it shows the, geog the geography, the geology, and the, obviously the location of this particular part of Jordan, Gora Safi, but it very much um, uh, shows this particular site, but also it's a good example of what many of the Jordan Rift Valley sites look like. And there's a lot that can be said. You can probably just sit here and talk about the entire site and the Jordan Valley just with this one photograph. So I thank Jane Taylor for having taken this photograph and she's here today. So I'm very happy. So, okay, now it's working. Uh, you saw this earlier, a relief map on your right and a, a political map on your left showing you uh, the location, obviously in the black circle, where this uh, Ghore Safi, this area in the Jordan, the southern Jordan Valley is located. So you see its location in the modern state, uh, city, uh, state uh, Hashemai Kingdom of Jordan and the geographic relief map on the left, which shows it uh, along the Great Rift Valley, which is the biggest schism on the Earth's surface, and this particular point where Vorisafi is happens to be the lowest part of the Rift Valley, and considering that the Rift Valley is the lowest uh, uh, schism on Earth, this is the lowest place on the Earth's surface. 
So we've got this fantastic geography along with all the archaeology and history that I'm going to be briefly outlining today. Here is a satellite image uh, showing you more detail of this southern end. Here is the um, alluvial, um, alluvial area, which is it's numbered 32 and it's very green, which means there's been there's a lot of very fertile um, land and that's really the key to this uh, success of this site going back over 12,000 years to the Neolithic period um, is basically fresh water and uh, it's it's at the it's at the um, at, at the um, alluvial um, uh, outspilling of the modern um, Wadi Al Hasa or the biblical Zared and it's the second biggest east-west running um, wadi or uh, riverbed. The, the biggest is farther north in Jordan in the Wadi Mujib, but the difference between these two is that in the Wadi Mujib farther north, there's no area to have settled um, uh, occupation. So the key thing here, of course, for the Gorisafi project is water and this land and rich agricultural alluvial soils, which really, um, is the reason that the site has been relatively successful for 12, 13,000 years, depending on your dating. And there might be some people here who can give me a better date, but it certainly goes back to the PPNB period, the Neolithic period. Right, <clears throat> the other important um, features of the Dead Sea in general, but particularly this area, are, you know, are the natural resources that have uh, that are uh, predominant that are uh, available in the Dead Sea area, and it's one of the um, uh, ways that this local community, particularly in the Lower Safi, was were 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 rich. It was uh, first of all salt, which seems very common today. Uh, it was a very important uh, commodity from the ancient, from very in, from from antiquity. Uh, bitumen, you see a piece of bitumen or tar, which was used from in all kinds of uh, uses from uh, um, uh, from Egyptian um, uh, mummy um, uh, mummification to um, uh, waterproofing boats and even waterproofing pottery. So a very important source also uh, coming from the Dead Sea. On the far right, you have a little sulfur ball encased in gypsum salts, which in the Old Testament they call brimstone. But sulfur is also uh, a very useful uh, chemical uh, composite that is used in antiquity for various reasons. And then uh, a plant here, which is not balsam, but it's a nice plant. So I have the photograph of it, I didn't have a photograph of, of, of the balsam flowering plant in this case, um, is a particular plant which is found in the Dead Sea and is used for making uh, balsam oils and sold uh, a, a, for, uh, particularly for, well, for perfumes and things. Anyway, so some of the reasons that, uh, that um, the Dead Sea uh, is a, was an attractive place for, for uh, economic natural resource uh, reasons. Um, ancient writers have mentioned uh, specifically the southeastern part of the Dead Sea, the Warasafi, the modern Warasafi. From the second century AD to the classical periods, uh, uh, Babatha archives, Jerome from the, in the early Byzantine Christian period, uh, later St. Stephen Sabaeth, uh, Islamic uh, uh, scholars, uh, Ibn Majid, uh, Makdisi, Ibn Hawakal, and even in the Cairo of Geniza, um, the site of uh, Horasafi or Zawara is mentioned. Uh, Al-Idrisi in the 12th century, uh, Yakut again, a lot of uh, medieval Islamic uh, or Arabic and Islamic uh, uh, references. Uh, crusaders like William of Tyre and Fulcher of Shatter, and even a Russian abbot in the 12th century. So lots of historical references and are located on this very important um, map um, 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 here by uh, Ali Drisi, showing you Zawara uh, and the Dead Sea, kind of stylized, but again, important. And there are other maps, uh, which are in volume one, mentioning the site and its importance in antiquity. Also, scholars that have described this beginning from 1872, Tristam, uh, make, making a nice, and Musil making a nice connection with also the fund here. Albright, Malone, Frank, Gluck in the 1930s, Rustin Schaub more recently doing excavations, McCreary, 
uh, Jeffrey King uh, from SOAS uh, doing, doing a survey in the area, Michael McDonald, who I, perhaps I can even dedicate this talk, he recently uh, passed away um, uh, a couple of months ago. Sorry? Burton. Burton. Not Michael. Oh my God, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Michael. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Burton McDonald, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. Um, and myself from the 19, uh, 1996 and onwards. Uh, and in this initial survey of the Southern Wars, um, my, uh, Burton MacDonald has published some of the uh, important sites in the area. Um, biblical, it, so are or Asafi is in the Old Testament mentioned as one of the five cities of the plain, and that's its biblical significance. Basically, uh, when uh, Lot was told. Uh, the prophet Lot, or Lot, was told to leave the destruction of Sodom because it was a bad city. Uh, he left and first went to uh, Zoara, but he didn't like it, maybe because it was small, because Zoara means Zoara, means small place. But he went and lived in a cave, and, and uh, with his family, daughters, and the story continues. This story is also recounted in the Old Testament, but also in the Quran. Uh, so, a well-known story uh, of the Bible and uh, Islamic sources, but I won't really go into that. Um, more famously, uh, the Zawara or Zoar, Zoara is, um, is located on the Madaba mosaic map you see there on the left, on the right, uh, with the um, kind of the three towers and encircled or surrounded by palm trees, date palms, and as you can see in this wonderful photograph by Jane Taylor, the palm <laughs> trees are still there, next near the Dead Sea, so the geographic uh, kind of uh, depiction on the Madaba map is, 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 uh, is, is very, uh, well, relatively correct, let's say. Um, and we also have references of date production in, in the early Christian period of, uh, of Zawara, along with other cities, of course. Um, our work started in the 1990s by uh, 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 lo looking at old uh, photographics, photograph, aerial photographs and locating on, on site um, by doing field walking and surveying, locating the various uh, sites in this Lora Safi area. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go now in detail and mention them to you, but from Lot Sanctuary all the way to the Neolithic PPNB sites um, here in the Wadi Hamrash. This is the whole area of the Lorisafi. It's not just one little um, specific site, but the whole area that we've included in the publications of, uh, well, in the studies, the surveys, the excavations, and the publications of uh, Zoara 1 and 2 uh, done here with the Palestine Exploration Fund. Um, more specific uh, um, maps. Uh, showing the road network and transportation transportation network, and we've walked up uh, three, four of these um, of these uh, wadis, Wadi Al Hasa, which I've mentioned, uh, the Nakab Abrash, Sarmuj, and uh, Kunea. These are all Roman Roman and later period roads going running north, uh, running east west uh, into Zawara, and they've been recorded. By the way. I think all the photographs you're seeing today are in the publications. Uh, and these are, this is the Gorasafi, the Dead Sea, and these are the Roman roads. And there I am walking along. You can see it's quite a nice stepped uh, imperial kind of uh, Roman road, which was reused in later periods too. But uh, major roads going down into the Jordan Valley, into the um, Gorasafi or Dead Sea areas, you can see how that's uh, uh, important, obviously, for the trade networks. Uh, we also have, from older maps and studies, the connections of Zohar uh, to the west, all the way to, um, to, the, to the coast of the Mediterranean, uh, not only by road networks, but also camel, uh, camel tracks and camel caravans, which still exist today. These, for instance, are um, Sidene Bedouins who are originally from the Negev and they still uh, move up and down the southern Jordan Valley uh, and uh, they particularly tend to stop in the area of Numera. But the point is, is there are still 
camel caravans and ca travel <coughs> by, by camels. In fact, there's one, the Wadi Abrash, which even has little um, uh, uh, paintings, uh, recent paintings of camels, so they are still used. Um, of course, uh, on the Madaba map, you have uh, boats crossing the, the Dead Sea uh, here from Zawara, which you just about you can see it there to the and, and the north, the other sites of uh, Kali Roy. Uh, the boats are going up and down the Dead Sea. We're lucky to have one of our inscribed uh, tombstones actually has a depiction of a similar kind of a boat with long oars. So it's very nice that it doesn't mention that this, this was a mariner, but it seems to be that this uh, was a tombstone from someone who, uh, who was um, a mariner of some sort. Uh, these are published. This, these are published. Uh, this, with this one and other inscriptions are published. Um, back to the Madaba map and the detail, Zawara. Our first excavations began to reveal um, what, are, what seem to be doorways or gateways to this walled city. And this is some of the uh, first evidence we had uh, in our excavations. Uh, we have uh, documents, mostly Roman uh, and Byzantine documents, mentioning Zoara as being a wealthy agricultural town based on agriculture and, and, and uh, animal husbandry. It was an important place. It's mentioned here, Zoara. This is from one of the, um, the cave of letters from one of these sites near, <coughs> near, well, you might call it one of the Dead Sea Scroll sites, not the, the most famous, but it certainly uh, is mentioned there. And on the far right, the lower far right, is a tombstone of one of the bishops of Zoara and named Apsis, uh, again found at the site. Um, we, um, we know from the, uh, from the, from uh, the uh, church, um, the early Byzantine church uh, 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 meetings that they have, that Zawara was represented in these councils of, of Nikea. So um, we have now a couple of, of mentions of bishops and archbishops coming from this town. So relatively important. I don't want to say it's extremely important, but it's really great to have the agricultural uh, mentions in, in, in documents and the kind of also the kind of ecclesiastical, uh, religious kind of uh, uh, mentions of this town of Zoara. We also have medieval uh, references to Zoara here in, in, a, um, in a, a crusader period uh, <coughs> uh, 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 map. Here it's called Zerur. And also Zerur is also mentioned here on a manuscript in St. Sinai, in St. Catherine's in Mount Sinai, which shows the walled city. Uh, substantial city in one of the Bibles uh, in, uh, in St. Catherine's Monastery. So medieval mentions and depictions of the town. And from our excavations, um, five meters down, we had remnants of mosaic pavements, as you can see here, the excavation and then just the mosaics, and some fragments of some beautiful fragments, actually, of marble chancel posts and various uh, church um, uh, architectural pieces. <coughs> we reckon that this is only the area that we <coughs> discovered, that it was a much larger church, possibly or even probably the Episcopal church, the, the, the church for the, for the bishops of Zoara. Quite important, but our excavations ended in 2018. And uh, that is now the extent of the work that we did there. This is now published. Uh, there are some inscriptions, but ins unfortunately they've been damaged because in the later Abbasid Islamic period, it was occupied and you can see the walk where they were walking, they actually disrupted the, um, the mosaics. They weren't damaged on purpose, but what we did discover, which was exciting, and or one of our conservatives, local, local workers, discovered the uh, cruciform, the base of the cruciform um, uh, baptistry, which uh, identifies it not only as a, there are not many baptistries in early Christianity in, in Jordan particular, but also it's a large adult uh, baptistry, which alludes to the fact that they're baptizing adults. So there's conversion <coughs> going on. And this is not, there are other sites such as Mount Nebo and Petra itself and other sites with large adult baptistries, but here's one more. Um, more recently, since we ended in 2000, 
2019, uh, 2018 are, are excavations. The Department of Antiquities came across another church which was found by a bulldozer, very near to the previous one, about two, 300 meters, and came up with another mosaic, which the bulldozer at least did not damage the mosaic, uh, with a very important and large uh, inscription. These are not very good photographs because they were done as part of a rescue project. We've uh, been able to pick out some of the designs. Um, this I'm particularly interested in. I didn't know what it was in the beginning, but I think it's um, red chili peppers hanging to dry. In the beginning, I thought it was a bird cage, which we have in Petra and some of But if you look at it carefully, it looks, there's hooks and there's like little red things. I don't know any parallels to that. Anyway, we now have new photographs that have been taken and uh, these are published in Zohar 2, uh, which is now uh, available here in the PDF, uh, and hopefully in the next volume we'll have uh, better images and more images of this. But this inscription, which is dated to the 6th century, uh, is interesting um, because it mentions a bishop, Georgios. And from the other site that I worked on, the sanctuary of Lot, there in the bottom, Lot's cave, Lot's... We also have a mosaic with the same date and mentioning the same bishop. So we're connecting now the town below with the monastery or sanctuary of Lot, which is a separate publication, which if anybody wants, I'm very happy to get copies of, but they are large, heavy, and they're in Jordan. So if you can come to Jordan, <laughs> I'll give you a free copy, because <laughs> now it's been published for over... 10 years plus. But anyway, the connection then with the town and the um, mo monastery of Lod is, 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 is confirmed with this new inscription and just published for the first time in volume two of Zohar. That's just one highlight. Many of the inscriptions now that I've mentioned, a couple of them, uh, are included, some of them are included as a summary in Zohar two, the current volume, but they were also published in, in, in uh, by our, a Greek colleague, uh, Yanis Meimaris, in the Greek National Research Center in Athens. But just a summary here, a quick summary. Some of the names, mostly in Greek, the Christian ones, Dusarios, a Nabataean or Semitic name, um, written in Greek, showing a continuity of local community, Arab Nabataeans, but here Christianized, Christians, and using the Greek language. But, you know, it doesn't mean that the, your ethnic path, your ethnic background of their ethnicity is Greek, it's just Christianity. Another one, Sausana Obedianos, again, a kind of a Nevitean Semitic name um, in Greek, Christian. Uh, but, and then the right, there are two inscriptions, one, again in Greek, mentioning an archisynagogos, a head of a synagogue. So, even though it's in Greek, it's a Jewish tombstone. And the one on the far right, one of the most interesting ones, because it shows somebody who died in Zoara, and this is written in Aramaic, a Jewish, in a Jewish Aramaic tombstone, but he came from Sephoris in the Sea of Galilee. So showing you um, connections, international connections. We have inscriptions also from Petra, from, from uh, Udru, and other places in Jordan. So there's international connections here that are being shown by these very important group of about 450 inscriptions. Um, the one on the cover of Zoara 2, you may have noticed, and on the poster is this very beautiful colored, original colored um, uh, tombstone with uh, green, white, red uh, colors um, and very typical early Christian depictions of crosses, fish, uh, birds, uh, and palm branches on the right. So, but very nicely, obviously very nicely uh, colored and so nice that we decided to choose it for the cover of this current book. <clears throat> and it also is, it has a very typical uh, 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 translation of what it, what it says. It, 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 it addresses the relatives of, of, the, of the dead person saying, Tharsi udisa thanatos, be courageous, no one is immortal. And this is a very common formula, both for Christians, uh, pagans, and Jews in this, in this period of the 4th, 5th, 6th centuries AD. So, uh, quite typical, but at the same time, uh, a unique um, find, which I think well represents Zohar 2 volume. 
And these are the three volumes dedicated only to the inscriptions of Zawara. Now, this is not, uh, these are not uh, uh, publications of the Past Exploration Fund, but I think they're all here in the library. And they're published in Greece. Uh, two volumes on the Greek inscriptions and one on the Jewish Aramaic uh, inscriptions, all from Zawara. Again, uh, highlighting the importance of this site uh, as far as uh, historical um, uh, periods are concerned. Uh, going back a bit now to pre-Christian, pre pre-Byzantine uh, times, we have the, the fortress of Zawara at Umm Tawabin, which, as I mentioned earlier, has been now um, supported with the last uh, and well-supported um, PEF uh, uh, projects has been uh, 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 funding the work that primarily uh, Alexandra Ariotti has done. Uh, we now have uh, very good evidence, and Alexandra, I think, is just submitting um, uh, an article to the PEQ and also to our ZOR3, summing up the final conclusions and giving good dates of this very impressive uh, fortress on top overlooking Zawara, the fortress of Zawara, here with a small uh, altar with a Nebetean inscription, very clear Nebetean um, identifications. But I'll leave it for the next issue of the PEQ, where Alexandra Ariotti will tell you the carbon-14 dating and her final conclusions on, on the pottery, which are very interesting. <laughs> okay, uh, the, I've already mentioned this plan, men, uh, I've already shown you this plan, mentioning the Islamic period, the medieval Islamic period of Zawara, or Zuhar, as it was called. It was, again, uh, a center for agriculture, and in this case, probably, well, what seems to be uh, uh, new products and new ways of, 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 of uh, enhancing agriculture during this, the periods of the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th centuries. AD, uh, and primarily with the two, two um, products, indigo and sugar, which have come in from the East, from India. Indigo actually is a purple dye that ind indicates it's coming from India. In Greek, it's called indigo, indigo, the product from India. So um, that uh, and sugar are two major products which come in during this Islamic period, and we have good evidence both from texts here, the Cairo Geniza is mentioning the best quality uh, uh, indigo for, for dyeing the, 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 this uh, uh, tzitzit is uh, coming from Zohar, from Zohara. And that's what they want, the best quality to, to make these dyes. Um, so we've got historical evidence and we've got archeological evidence, two large pots with holes um, and we had no idea what these were. These were belonging to the kind of Abbasid period, the period, same period as the uh, as the Cairo Geniza. And uh, we worked out from ethnographic work in Oman, in Bakhla, similar large pots with holes where they would collect the plant, the indigo plant, and put it in this pot, and it would basically rot, and it, this the, 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 the water would slowly come out, the liquid. And what would, which you would end up with is a concentrated uh, a cube or concentrated uh, material that you would use to dye fabrics. And this is a chemical process, uh, which was again uh, related to this early Islamic uh, period coming from India. And uh, we were lucky enough to have also two little, um, what we're identifying as indigo crucibles, uh, where you would have this concentrated indigo dye. And in the British Museum today, you can, and at the Victoria and Albert Museum, you can see similar kind of uh, vessels where they would collect this um, uh, indigo dye. And it makes the connection with India via Khurasan, which is exactly what uh, the historical sources and now archaeological sources are, are telling us that this new uh, uh, product of indigo is, is coming through. Uh, so the identification of these in the British Museum and the Victoria as crucibles for indigo help us identify the ones that we found on the right in the Rorasafi. Sugar was the next big product, again, connected with kind of the chemical industry of coming out of uh, Central Asia and into the Arab world. Uh, and here we excavated uh, two very large uh, presses. Presses, here you see the reconstruction of the pressing, crushing and pressing of the sugar cane 
and we have the upper rooms and the lower rooms, and a whole lecture can be conducted about this sugar processing. But on our last um, year of excavation, 2018, we were able to do the reconstruction <coughs> of it. We were able to work out the, the water system, including the canats, and uh, a system of irrigation, which again has come from the east, uh, and enhanced agriculture during this uh, during this, this period, this middle, early Islamic period. Um, for instance, um, it introduced a tri-semester kind of agricultural uh, season, adding another season instead of the one or two of the Greco-Roman uh, Byzantine periods. So um, water systems, technological uh, new products, all enhancing uh, new and new agricultural products, all enhancing uh, the area as an agricultural and economic uh, center. This was the final, uh, ex ex what we finally exposed in, in the um, east of the presses that you saw, was a series of 12 furnaces where they would boil the sugar juice, the, the pressed sugar juice, reduce it, and then put it in little rooms for it to dry, crystallize, dry, and then sell these cones for quite a lot of money to the West, well, via Venice and uh, you know, our traders from the Mediterranean. Uh, this is an example from the West Indies, but very similar kind of rows of, of, of boiling, um, uh, copper boiling vessels, where they would boil and reduce the, the crushed sugar juice. Uh, a lot has been written about this, and we actually have a whole volume on this, but I'm not gonna go on too much about it. But we were lucky enough to also have uh, uh, several of these uh, large copper uh, vessels for cauldrons for boiling and reducing this. There were, some of them were even in situ in the 12 uh, uh, furnaces on site. This is the area of the furnaces and we now have been able to reconstruct uh, six of these. Uh, two of them were standing. We've reconstructed the, um, these, uh, these arches above the uh, area where they would um, boil the sugar and <coughs> curing rooms and leave them to crystallize. So this was, if you think in terms of industrial archaeology, but food technology, this was the clean area. So we have a series of two arches that were covered. This was a covered area to keep this food production clean. And the plan is to put up the other series of six arches and then put a cover and expose the areas where this sugar processing would hap was happening. Up until now, people focused just on the uh, presses and said this is the sugar, sugar press. Now we actually have the, uh, the area where they would um, process the sugar uh, as a clean food product. And in one of these rooms, we found some little clay things stamped with the word uh, stamp, hatim. And I'm saying, in, in Zuhara 2, it's now published uh, in this volume, that this was, um, this was found in the rooms which were um, controlled by the state, the, 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 the Islamic state, because uh, uh, it was a state-sponsored product. And this, these rooms were sealed, like you have uh, the large trucks that were going from here to Europe or wherever, and they have little lead seals, and you can't open them because it's, you know, they're sealed by the customs people. That's, we have text talking about the customs agents that would come from Damascus to collect the sugar product when it was done, and that's what I think these are. That's quite exciting. It's the stamps uh, sealing these rooms where the sugar product, where the final product was stored. And specialized pots. This is the upper cone where would, the sugar syrup would drip into and the lower molasses pot where it would cure, crystallize, and then you break it open and uh, you have the cone of sugar. 80% uh, of our pottery is are sugar pots from the site and we know it's being produced locally because we have wasters and kiln and kiln furniture showing that there was local production of specialized pottery so you have another kind of uh, industrial kind of production of pottery not just the sugar itself this is what it looks like today and there are now um, studies that have been done not only on the pottery and the agriculture but we're also Honored to have with us today someone who has done the current report on the on the um, on the animal bounds and uh, the first in in volume two there is an initial study and in the next volume we're having 
uh, a further study on the animal bones and working out the possible uh, introduction, possible, since she's here today, she can tell us if I'm wrong or not. If we have new uh, uh, other animals coming again from India that may help in other ways, such as uh, tilling the fields. Uh, so we have exciting studies that are now being published in <coughs> volumes two and three of Zohar about the animal use during this period. Uh, now I've mentioned that the sugar industry was state sponsored. Uh, it's mentioned in some documents which talk about the sugar industry, but we're also uh, very lucky to have in the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, in one of the columns, it actually says that the product, the sugar product from al Ghor, which is Jordan Valley, the Southern Jordan Valley specifically, um, there's a so-called sugar decree, and it, mean, it says this is the property of the state. So it's very, very good, um, uh, helps very much our understanding of the importance of the sugar industry as a state industry and how important it was to actually have this inscription in the most important uh, mosque in Damascus, which was the capital of the Bilad al the, 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 the middle Islamic uh, or even early Islamic uh, capital of the area. Um, other pottery which helped the connections with this, which are now published in Zohar too. Uh, are fine uh, uh, glazed wares that are coming from Syria, Iraq, Egypt, and Cyprus, and some even being locally made uh, imitations. In um, the following uh, 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 publications of Zawar, we also now have an analysis of the glaze. So we have a technical analysis of the ceramic, of the pottery, and the glaze types, not just the beautiful photographs you see here and drawings. Uh, we also have handmade pots and some handmade pots that have inscriptions, uh, graffiti in ink, as you can see here. These are from 14th century, 12th to 14th century, and the one on the right is from the Abbasid period. These are published also in the um, in the, in in volume two of of Warsafi, Zawara. and glass studies, which we have an initial uh, 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 presentation of. In Zohar 2, but Zohar 3 will have a full um, analysis of, uh, of the glass. Um, uh, coins are also included in Volume 2. We have everything from Byzantine uh, uh, coins to Crusader and Islamic coins. Not many, but a good um, uh, array of coins that help us uh, to correlate the pottery and other finds with the actual uh, coin assemblage. And now, almost finally, uh, the publications. I think now you're probably all familiar with the first um, volume, Zohar 1, with the beautiful photograph of Jane Taylor on the cover. And now we have in the second volume, Zohar 2, uh, this very impressive uh, photograph of this uh, inscription, uh, fifth century inscription tombstone inscription. That photograph is actually taken by Trevor Springett, uh, formerly of the British Museum. Both wonderful photographs, I think, to, um, to uh, uh, show the, 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 the importance of, of, of the site. Um, we also have the next photograph on the right is, uh, shows the Madaba map detail. There's a, a popular book which is, uh, sum up, sums up all the periods from the Neolithic to Ottoman. Um, of the Zawara. This is published with ACOR, the American Center in Amman. It's available for free hard copies, but also online for free. You can download it. And uh, if anybody wants, I can give them the link. It's a lovely little book, which the PDF has a copy of here. So a nice popular version. And we're about to uh, 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 work on the final volume. But before I mention that, all the way on your right was an earlier a research project that I did on the sugar and you can see it there, another publication focusing on the sugar industry in the Lower Safi, but generally also in, in the Levant and the Jordan Valley. So these are the three publications, some inscriptions, four publications here um, uh, on Zohar, it's archaeology, summing up the material. Of course, there's more work that can be done. 
And in the near future, like April, inshallah, uh, we will have Zohar 3. And this is some of the uh, preliminary um, uh, list of, of, of things that were, are going to be published, I hope. Some, some reports I have already, some are coming, but we hope to have that third and final volume. And I can, uh, I'd like to also now to also formally announce that uh, the University of Warsaw, which I had gone to Jordan with uh, the Dean of the University of Warsaw on the team, I have um, accepted uh, to continue this project and uh, two weeks ago put in an application formally to the Department of Antiquities of Jordan. So I've handed them over the project and I'm very happy. I'll go out with them in April and help with the transition, but the project will continue under the University of Warsaw, which seems to have good funding. And I will continue to do other things. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Dino. That was fantastic. Um, I'm intrigued by the origins of the sugar industry. Where does that initially come from before it finds itself in the, uh, in the Horizafi? Do we know? Yes, well, I mean, it's again one of these products that's coming out of India, okay. like almost everything. Uh, or Southeast Asia is where the sugar came originally. Uh -huh. okay. But the whole technology of, of, of sugar, even today, is, is, is done on a small scale. But mm -hmm. the big advance that, that, that Islamic, um, the, the medieval Islamic uh, period uh, um, took on, and it's not just Zawara, there were well, maybe maybe 60 sugar factories up and down the Jordan Valley. They made a state sponsorship. They produced it on a big, big scale, so they could be so it could be more profitable. Otherwise, it's not very profitable. But you know, we can go on about that. They introduced you know things like slavery. Uh, it's quite a big topic. And actually, that one book um, it summarizes some of the work, but also there are people working on this topic. But the Lorisafi was probably the, the, the center of the sugar production in the area. Fantastic. Any other questions for Dino? Carlson. You know, just to ask generally, I mean, uh, Dino, what, they, what do you know about the extent of the pre classical settlement of Zoara? Have you mapped it at all? In Zoara 1, mm. we came across uh, a very large, uh, low mound. Uh, Late Iron II pottery. Mm. Uh, we did. Uh, we did two. Well, I, I published a very brief identification of the site, and then we did some. In two thousand, we did a, two small trenches, um, and it was late Iron II pottery. Mm. Uh, I baptized it Tulilat Kazar Musa Hamid because there used to be a mud brick house with a local said it's, it's Kazar Musa Hamid. Musa Hamid being the person who owned it. So because it was a low mound, I said too little up. Since then, in, the, in, in 2017, 18, um, um, uh, uh, another colleague from Australia has excavated in the center of this tell, and well, low tell, in the agricultural fields. And we also did a map. It's in Zawara 1, repeating really uh, the Iron 2. It's near to the Dead Sea. so trying to work out the locations of different periods. So the Iron Age period is probably truly really like, well, not, well, if you want to, I, if you want to associate Iron Age with the Old Testament and Zawara of the Old Testament, that's not my business, but if you want to, it's there. Early Bronze Age, as you may know, there's huge Early Bronze Age Cemetery, which we've also published in volume one, uh, uh, the, the introduction to the site and the pottery by Elliot Brown was done by myself. Uh, but a lot more work needs to be done there. The early Bronze Age is, is fascinating and there are some interesting pots that are probably made there that are traveling around these little sake cups. Elliot Brown says that these are coming from there. So, and then of course there's Neolithic. There's a Neolithic site up the mountain, which is more or less in the lower sake, a little bit far away, but we've included it in the in, in the area, and it's quite a rich uh, 
been there built. It's quite a rich and important site with buildings standing to their windows. In fact, it looks like it's Ottoman, but it's not, it's Neolithic. And um, so prehistoric, yeah. No, thank you. It's useful to have that sort of... Driving. It's in Zawara 1. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. What did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Yes, Julian. Julian, yeah, have you got um, the same sort of coins that you had at Avata and Lot? <laughs> well, Peter, Peter Edwell, who did the coins, he's certainly quoting you. Okay. Uh, not as many coins. Uh, because we're in the down below and it's even saltier the soil, so they're basically exploding. So not not that many coins. We just have a few dozen, really. But you know, Darren Abada, because you do the coins there, um, we are lucky to have some hoards which we haven't had down there. So the coin hoards, yeah, which by the way have not been fully published. Um, uh, we're lucky to have that 555 in one little that, and that was that helped a lot. But I think Dar Nevada has more coins than, certainly more coins than the city. For that matter, it has more coins than Petra. I think, still. I don't know if it still does, but... No, those coins, what were they? A couple thousand coming from that little monastery. Yeah. 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 Lots of rich coins. No, they're mostly just, you know, yeah. just <laughs> donations of new mines, whatever yeah. they're called. No, nothing special. Yeah. Two more. John. I just wonder, is there any evidence of Egyptian occupation or trade or involvement in this <coughs> part of the Rift Valley? Well, there's this, I mentioned this thing about bitumen and there's this, there's this, you know, interest in the Dead Sea because of its bitumen. But for, in the early Bronze Age, and here Jonathan Tuck could help us, there certainly was, you know, Egyptian, Egyptians wanted to come up, Shishank and others coming up the Jordan Valley and, you know, hitting on people. And the early Bronze Age pottery, some of it, and there's, there's, there's those, uh, what do they call those, uh, maces, mace heads. Oh, and, mace heads, and yeah. They may be coming from Egypt. So, I mean, this is so far south, it's virtually, it's virtually, it's within Egyptian, uh, uh, what's it called, in a territory, but uh, dominance. Yeah. So there's very strong, in the Bronze Age, uh, in the Middle Bronze Age, we had one seal, mm -hmm. which was Egyptian, from a tomb. But otherwise, well, there's some glazed pottery from the later periods. Ah, and a Dera Nabada, which is more or less Warsafi. We did have, uh, oh, no, it, oh no, actually from Zawar, we had some pottery which was Coptic, one or two pieces. So it's far enough south, it's quite close to, uh, I mean, its, it's connections are more near to Egypt than to <laughs> Damascus. But it depends on the politics of the day, too. You know what also you had, I mean, the the bitumen, a lot of the bitumen in Egypt comes exactly from here, and that must have been one of the principal export uh, industries uh, for this region. In fact, the petrochemical analysis has shown actually it does come from precisely this region. Huge demand in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Louise, you had your hand up. Yeah, more a question really um, about visitors. Uh, I know you put a huge amount of energy into displaying and exhibiting this area. And it seems that the sugar production site is kind of unique in Jordan anyway. How has it picked up with, with visitors? Has it picked up in their imagination, both local or tourism? Yeah, I mean, this talk was focusing on the PF publications, yeah. but um, uh, those arches you saw, which were, we only had two that were in situ, but now we put up six with support of the American Institute of Archaeology. Uh, AIA, a American Institute of Archaeology, and ACOR, the American Center, has also put up signage twice now, or three times, because they keep smashing them, but we've done local training courses in the last year with the American Center, and uh, there is a steady uh, interest in this site because it's a kind of a, it's not a unique completely, there are other sugar factory sites, but it has, they haven't been exposed like this one. Mm -hmm. So uh, our American friends, colleagues, are uh, supporting this, and there is a definitely, I don't want to say stream of interest, but there certainly is interest, and hopefully there will be more site development protection for this. And what I haven't mentioned here at all is the museum. There is a local museum yes. which has many of these objects, or most of them, in there, and displays. But again, this wasn't the topic of this talk, but the museum, <laughs> I should have put in something there. But certainly the museum, it's actually 
in Zawara 1, the mention and the photographs of the museum itself. So it's certainly in the two volumes mm -hmm. of, of the PF volumes, the museum, which is an important part of the local uh, community engagement and involvement. It's an excellent place, <laughs> yes. There's also the Zawara kitchen. Which is Safi a, a kitchen. Kind of Safi kitchen, that's right, close by, which is a great place you know to that. stop for lunch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they modeled that <laughs> along along the kind of Petra kitchen. Uh -huh. And the idea is you go there and you cook your own food. Yeah. Uh, you have to book it in advance. Yeah. So it's not like somewhere you just arrive. And again, that's supported by the American Center. Uh, and there's a website for that. Yeah, it's a very good idea, but you've got to tell them in advance. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, I'm going to hand over now to Jonathan, our president, to um, just say a few words to finish up and to thank Dino for his fantastic presentation. Um, so over to you, Jonathan. Thank you. Yes, just a few choice words, aphorisms and uh, jokes. <laughs> um, no, I <laughs> what can I say? It seemed to me, Dino, that if you wanted uh, further sponsorship of putting more arches up, you could approach McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't think of that. <laughs> no, seriously. Great, great, great talk. You always speak so well, Dino. And I think, you know, what Dino shows us really is that you can do archaeology. And if you present it in the right way, it really comes to life. And you really feel the, the area. And I think uh, that's absolutely brilliant, Dino. So well done for that. I'm going to mention the, the books again in a moment. Um, I should point out that, you know, Dino and I go back, what, 40 years, uh, pretty much, and Dino started to tell us the idea together, and to Louise as well. This is kind of a reunion, mm -hmm. isn't it, really? Uh, but since then, he's done a wonderful job. He downplayed it slightly. Dare and about his great excavation mm -hmm. project, and uh, that volume, it is big and heavy. It is. It is very big. big and heavy, yes. yeah. Yeah, but it's well worth it. I mean, do, do <laughs> take him up on his offer. If he'll give you a free one, it's well worth having. Um, At this point, yes, but you've got to come to Jordan. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. <laughs> but since then, again, uh, in doing things the other way around, uh, Dino has also worked in Oman. And in fact, I followed in his footsteps at the site of Russell Had, uh, working in the fort of Russell Had in, in Oman. So we've had a lot of history together. And he's always been a, a great scholar and a great friend and really a brilliant archaeologist. So, Dino, thank you. But before you give another round of clapping, endlessly, then can I just um, show you the flyers for the two volumes that we have. We've got some copies of the book here, which you can, you're very welcome to have a look through. Um, if you decide that you do want to purchase them, oh, I've only got one here. Then, uh, if you take one of these, I've got one flyer for Zara 1, the other for Zara 2, Two, um, both of them are available in uh, quite expensive hardbacks, but also uh, now in paperback. I think this is these are the first issues in a paperback series of the annual, which are much much more reasonable. So, if you're interested, have a look at the copies uh, that are behind Ava there on that table, and uh, take one of these, fill it in. You can do it online, I believe. Um, and uh, you will thoroughly enjoy them. So, um, and you get twenty percent off. Oh yes, yes, for, for being so, here so and enjoy, enjoying enjoying Dino's lecture, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you get twenty percent discount. So, once again, Dino, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.